I will never get tired of talking about this iconic show. Every week we would come and knock on the door of our favorite group. John Ritter is an absolute icon. His portrayal of stumble-prone Jack was genius, not to mention hilariously funny. The real story of what happened on the show can be found in our previous video here. The story is three kids, well, young adults, renting an apartment in Santa Monica, California, and their nosy landlords who often get mixed up in their hijinks. It's filled with hilarious misunderstandings that in my opinion never get old, and it was a highlight of my week, and eventually, during the day, once it hit syndication. The cast would shift from Chrissy to Cindy to Terry, and the landlords would go from the Ropers over to Mr. Furley. But it was all good. It aired for eight seasons on ABC from March 15, 1977 to September 18, 1984. And it was based on the British sitcom Man About the House, and the show also spawned similar spin-offs. Three's Company would have the Ropers, which was based on George and Mildred, and Three's a Crowd, based on Robin's Nest. Afternoon everybody and how's it going Habib's world? You are welcome here. In the 1980s sitcom was king for 22 minutes give or take, you could delight in the laugh track and escape with your favorite friends. Whether hanging out with Dorothy and the gang or raising a glass in your local bar, today let's remember 80s sitcoms that we loved. Well, we're moving on. Jeffersons is an American sitcom television series that was broadcast on CBS from January 18, 1975 to July 2, 1985 and lasting 11 seasons, which is pretty unheard of in the sitcom world. The Jeffersons was another show that was full of laughs and Sherman Hemsley portraying George Jefferson was amazing. You have to eat while you're working? Don't worry, I can do two things at the same time. I don't want you to do two things at the same time. Okay, you are the boss. Put the apple away. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> the show featured an affluent, upper-class black family made up of Louise Weezy Jefferson, her husband George Jefferson, and their son Lionel Jefferson. It was during the eighth season of the show that it became the first African-American sitcom since Sanford and Son to ascend into the top five ratings. The Jeffersons would go on to receive 13 Emmy nominations. And in 1981, Isabel Sanford became only the second black actress to win the award for Best Actress. And the Jeffersons pushed the envelope of what sitcoms could give voice to by tackling racism, divorce, alcoholism, adult literacy, and gender identity. For example, in episode 31 of season two entitled Florence's Problem, Louise notices Florence's strange behavior and draws the conclusion that Florence is contemplating ending her own life. After finding a suspicious letter written by Florence, George and Wheezy manage to talk Florence out of committing the act. I'm only the maid, and I ain't even a very good one at that. She's right about that. She's a terrible maid. <laughs> well, in your case, honey, you get as good as you deserve. We only hired you because nobody else wanted you. <laughs> you mean I only took the job? because nobody else would. We only let you keep it because we love you. <laughs> you what? This episode is one of the first times that a sitcom addressed such a heavy premise. Amazingly, after 11 seasons of critical success, the show ended under a cloud of controversy, as it was just canceled. The cast was not informed until after the July 2nd, 1985 episode, Red Robins. Isabel Sanford remarks that she heard about the show's cancellation through her cousin in New York, who read it in a tabloid magazine. They called us in April, like in the middle of hiatus, and to say that we were off the, we were canceled. I didn't realize it 
my cousin in New York is the one that called me and said, I understand that Jefferson's has been canceled. I said, who said so? I hadn't heard. By the, She said it's in the tabloid. And Sherman Hemsley learned of the news by reading it in the newspaper. Collectively, the cast has publicly stated that the cancellation with no proper finale was the ultimate disrespect by the network. Unlike other shows such as Happy Days, New Heart, and The Mary Tyler Moore Show, the Jeffersons were never given a proper send-off that the cast and their fans rightfully deserved. And in my opinion, it was just a rotten move by the network. <laughs> Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. There are some TV shows that instantly have a theme song that you can identify. Cheers was definitely one of them. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. It was also clever, funny, and of course a classic sitcom. Even for me, I always try to have a Norm-inspired afternoon everybody in my videos. Good afternoon everybody. Hey! Norman? Here's the pitch. How you doing, Norm? Cut the small talk and give me a beer. <laughs> the love story of Sam and Diane, or the knowledgeable Cliff Clavin, would add charm, humor, and wit. I'm the best thing that could have happened to you and you're too stupid to realize. Are you kidding me? You are the worst thing that happened to me. And before you came here, I was a happy man. You honestly believe you were happier before you met me than you are now? Hell yes! I mean, how do you think it feels to be attracted to someone that makes you sick? <laughs> and of course, Frasier would go on to be one of the biggest spin-offs in TV history. Recently, we sadly lost Kirstie Alley. However, as Rebecca Howe, she was great. After Shelley Long left the show, there was some speculation as to why. Some say the cast did not get along. However, in December 1986, Shelley Long decided to leave Cheers for a movie career and family, she says, and that she and Ted Danson had done some really terrific work at Cheers. After that, those would be some big shoes to fill. And rather than making a copycat of Diane, who was a bit spoiled and snobby, Rebecca Howe was a hot mess, and it worked. Let's take a little look at some of those moments. Whatever it was you were doing, and I will get out of your life forever. Uh, Rebecca, I... Sam, please. It'll make it a lot easier. <laughs> you know, I might just become a bag lady. <laughs> They're not all old, you know. It could happen. <laughs> it really could. <laughs> A cup of coffee, huh? Why would I do that? Well, because I've seen a lot of ladies hit the champagne in my time. One minute they're doing just fine, the next minute kind of sneaks up on them and they're doing all sorts of wild and crazy. Why am I giving you coffee? <laughs> what are you looking at, pretty lady? I'm looking at you. Well, I'm looking back at you. I think I'm beginning to see you in a whole new light. <laughs> well, why don't you tell me what you see? You have a really weird face. <laughs> Your eyebrows are growing together like a big old ugly caterpillar. <laughs> The show ran on NBC from September 30th, 1982 to May 20th, 1993, with a total of 275 half-hour episodes across 11 seasons. Like many of television's greatest success stories such as Seinfeld or The Office, Cheers was not an immediate hit. It premiered on September 30th, 1982 to dismal ratings, landing in 77th place out of 100. However, it was said that it was NBC's entertainment president at the time, Brandon Tartikoff, who saved the show from cancellation. And as the show's popularity rose, it did not take long for word to spread that the Beacon Hill Tavern was the real Cheers, although only the exterior shots were filmed there. 
turning this neighborhood hangout into a tourist attraction. To satisfy the masses, a second location was actually called Cheers. <laughs> Roseanne was created by Matt Williams and Roseanne Barr. It aired on ABC from October 18, 1988 to May 20, 1997. Unlike other sitcoms, Roseanne was grounded in real life with the experiences that any blue-collar family might go through. It also tackled very tough subjects such as racism, homophobia, money woes, infidelity, domestic violence, and more. No subject was taboo. Due to an unfortunate parallel, the topics tackled in the show would align with the cancellation of Roseanne and her removal from the reboot based on alleged racist comments made on social media. Aside from Roseanne Barr, we have the great John Goodman. Yeah, but I was. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? No. Am I wrong? As well as Alicia Gorenson and Michael Fishman. The latter of the two played Becky and DJ. It's also one of the only shows that would replace one of their lead actresses and nod to it in the show. I believe that they replaced that Darren. I like the second Darren much better. <laughs> Where in the hell have you been? <laughs> Where the hell have you been? <laughs> Why does everyone keep saying that? Because in 1992, at age 18, Gorenson decided she wanted to attend Vassar College. To accommodate her request, Roseanne's producers eventually opted to write Becky out of the show via a storyline which she ran off in a lope with boyfriend Mark Healy, played by Glenn Quinn. The actor Glenn Quinn would be another tragic story. See, he was just 32 years old when he was found dead at a friend's North Hollywood, California apartment on December 3rd, 2002. According to the Los Angeles Times, the actor who had long struggled with drug addiction passed away from an accidental heroin overdose. Aside from the main cast, this would also be one of the first roles for George Clooney. George Clooney appeared in the first season as Roseanne Barr's boss at the factory where she worked. You know, you have an attitude problem. I do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking that we should uh, work on it someplace outside of the workplace. Where would you suggest? The backseat of your car? <laughs> No, no, I was thinking um, more along the lines of my apartment. <laughs> Clooney took this role in 1988, right after he was fired from Facts of Life in 1987, which of course is another amazing 80s sitcom. Roseanne would also be famous for their Halloween episodes, where they took things to another level. Fans of the show would have mixed reviews for the spoiler alert finale of the series. And this is where Roseanne and Dan win the lottery and finally get some break in life. However, it is then learned this has all been in the writings that Roseanne is doing, and Dan sadly passed away years before after a heart attack. It was also said that Roseanne could be difficult to work with. Roseanne even stated that she never keeps writers around for more than two seasons. By then, I've gotten the very best out of them, and they are fired. Ironically, amongst these writers, one was Joss Whedon, who went on to many hits. We'll make our better than okay. So while our actual billings were up, our total revenues were down. You see, that's the problem. Overdue accounts. Uh -huh. Right? These clients have got to pay what they owe, and that's why I want you to talk to her. This is not a difficult thing to do. I have done sales at other stations. I've done sales at big stations. If an overdue client does not pay, you simply replace that client with another one. Oh, oh yeah. Uh-huh. What did I just say? Jeez, don't you know? While this show was never a huge hit and aired for only four seasons on CBS, from September 18, 1978 to April 21, 1982, I loved it. WKRP in Cincinnati centers around a radio station, back when people still listen to the radio, that is going through a format change, from easy listening slash big band to rock and roll, all in the hands of country music-loving Andy Travis. 
It is a small radio station with some staff members not enjoying that change in music. Also, as an AM radio station, it's already not a huge hit. While the radio station itself never became a huge hit in the show, it is the relationships of the cast that make this a great show. Looks like we're stuck in here forever, man. Yeah. Sooner or later, we're gonna run out of provisions, and then he's sure to get us. It was the monster who sold life insurance, insurance, insurance. <laughs> Gary Sandy would be Andy Travis, who is the grounded program manager of the station and possibly the most logical of the team. Then we have the bumbling station manager, Arthur Carlson, played by Gordon Jump, who is kind-hearted, although not such a bright leader. Then with his tacky suits and always longing for the secretary, Jennifer, we have Frank Bonner, who played Herb Tarlick in sales. Richard Sanders would be our neurotic weather reporter and straight shooter, Les Nessman. And of course, he is immensely proud of his award. And up to the minute commentary from one of journalism's most trusted voices, five-time winner of the Buckeye News Hawk Award. <laughs> Howard Hessman was the rock and roller DJ. Dr. Johnny Fever, who would be the person to pretend to not really care about his job, but in reality, that is a cover, and he has many moments of tenderness. Jan Smithers would be our straight-laced Bailey Quarters. She's always trying to break out of the mold, but is sometimes too timid to take that step. She has an on-again, off-again romance with Dr. Johnny Fever in the early episodes. Then we have Jennifer Marlowe, played by Lonnie Anderson. Jennifer is the receptionist at the AM radio station. She sits at the desk in the lobby, answering the few phone calls the station gets and taking messages. When asked to do more, Jennifer is very clear about what her job does and does not entail. She does not take dictation, type letters, or make her get coffee. I am a receptionist, she says, and I receive. And then we have Venus Flytrap, played by Tim Reed. And he would be our smooth-talking nighttime DJ who the ladies would swoon over and was in charge of the evening music. And one thing I remember about the show was the music. Not the music they played on the radio, specifically the two theme songs. They had one theme song in the opening. It was catchy, fun, and very popular, and you could sing along to. Baby, if you've ever wondered, wondered whatever became of Then you have the one in the end credits, which was interesting, and I never really quite understood what they were saying. And did you know station manager Andy Travis is actually based on a real person? The character of Randy Travis was based on real radio program director Michael Harrington, whose full name was Marion Harrington, who was considered an innovator in the radio world, with his pseudonym Captain Mikey. Also, the characters of Arthur Carlson and Dr. Johnny Fever are based on actual radio personalities, with Dr. Johnny Fever's traced back to Atlanta DJ Skinny Bobby Harper, who was famous for giving the morning moo cow report. And also, while airing the two-part pilot, the actor who plays Les Nessman, Richard Sanders, legitimately cut his finger and wound up having to wear a bandage on the air. So on every episode, Les finds a reason to wear a bandage. Uh, I believe Les found the trash smasher. <laughs> oh, I like that trash smasher very much. Herb, give me some trash to put in there. I just plum forgot trash, Les. Give me your belt. <laughs> Speaking of shows with amazing chemistry, we cannot ignore The Golden Girls. It features iconic actors, hilarious, and occasionally poignant storylines. The Golden Girls is absolutely one of the best shows made. Harry, who is this Harry? All Blanche said was he still has his own teeth and hair. It was a highly acclaimed and rated, well-received, popular American sitcom that aired on NBC from September 14, 1985 to May 9, 1992. The series ran for a total of seven seasons and 180 full-length episodes. The series revolves around four older single women, three widows and one divorcee, sharing a house in Miami, Florida. While that is the context of the show, they did not simply focus on their age. 
They focused on real world things that we all deal with. Love, career, and you know, the occasional murder. But they are both murderers. Sit down, Dorothy, don't make a fool of yourself. <laughs> Care to explain? In the first place, it is unlikely that Gloria murdered her father. Statistics show that patricide is overwhelmingly a male crime, although daughters frequently murder their mothers. After six consecutive seasons in the top 10 and the seventh season at number 30, the Golden Girls came to an end when B. Arthur chose to leave the series. In the hour-long series finale, which aired on May 1992, Dorothy meets and marries Blanche's Uncle Lucas, played by Leslie Nielsen. We have sadly lost all of the main stars of the show, most recently with the great Betty White. However, we will always have the show to visit the girls and to say thank you for being our friends. Well, it's been an experience that I'll always keep very close to my heart. And that these are memories that I'll wrap myself in when the world gets cold and I forget that there are people who are warm and loving and... We love you, too. <laughs> oh. I'll miss you. I'll miss you. Oh. 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 You will always be a part of us. Uh. Oh. Okay, you're in room two. The bed's made up and everything. Oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> um, before you go... Yes? Our maid is terribly overworked. Anything that you could do to help would really be appreciated. <laughs> you know, like sleeping on top of the covers and not using your towels. Do you mind if I use the soap? Oh, not at all. We're here for your comfort. <laughs> Newhart. I love Bob Newhart. His deadpan stuttering delivery of humor is absolutely spot on. I watched the original Bob Newhart show and I watched Bob as an innkeeper in Vermont in Newhart. It was just such a wholesome show that filled me with comfort. Michael, that is not entertainment, that is, that is exploitation. Tomato, tomato, Dick. If you ever watch the original Bob Newhart show where he was a psychiatrist, you will certainly love the finale of the Newhart show. Again, spoiler alert, I know it's an old show, but I just feel like I have to throw that out there in case someone wants to watch it on their own. In the finale, it turns out the entire show was a dream of Bob from his first series. He wakes up with his wife in bed, Suzanne Plachette, that is, his wife from his first series. And, well, this is what happens. Ah! <laughs> uh, honey. <laughs> Honey, wake up. You, you won't believe the dream I just had. Mm. <laughs> but don't you want to hear about it? What is it? Well, I, I was an innkeeper in this crazy little town in Vermont. I'm happy for you. Good night. No, nothing, nothing made sense in this place. I mean, the, the, the maid was an heiress. Her, her husband talked in, in alliteration. The, the handyman kept missing the, the point of things. And then there were these three woodsmen. But... <laughs> Only one of them talked. That settles it. No more Japanese food before you go to bed. <laughs> and, I, and I was married to this, this beautiful blonde. Go back to sleep, bum. Good night, Ellen. Mm. You mean beautiful blonde? <laughs> Go to sleep, Emily. Yeah. You know you uh, you really should wear more sweaters.
Newhart aired on CBS from October 25, 1982 to May 21, 1990, with a total of 184 episodes. Aside from Bob, we would have a great cast with dim-witted George Utley played perfectly by Tom Poston, a pretentious debutante maid played by Julia Duffy as Stephanie, and three backwood brothers named Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl, that's my other brother Daryl. <laughs> and Stephanie's beau, Michael Harris, played by the late great Peter Scolari. Currently this show is not available to stream, which is a tragedy. While some episodes can be floating around on social media, we need this on a streaming platform. And that is some of the shows I loved and I hope you do too. We are a climbing little channel so any like and subscribe you could add would be greatly appreciated. So if you have a few seconds I would love to have you as part of our friends. Until next time, take care and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Subscribe to